Chapter 6 The Soul of Wit I was allowed to walk back unaided to where Max Kleiner was waiting, but two Hanks followed closely behind me, each holding an identical pistol in their identical hands. Max Kleiner, meanwhile, had transformed into Max Showoff. He seemed only slightly put out when I interrupted his spiel to say, It was you that sent those thugs to kill me last night after the party, wasn't it? He opened his hands in a what-can-I-say gesture. After Rock told me he should have recognized you and didn't, I was worried how much you knew. Which Rock was that? I asked. Pleased, I timed my question to coincide with walking past several of them propped up inside their bell jars. We really were in the country of the bizarre now. It's best to plan ahead, Kleiner told me. You never know when you might need a new star. So the first rock was right when he said someone was out to kill him. Kleiner shook his head. Wrong on every count, lady. He was starting to annoy me but I smiled to show otherwise. Oh? He wasn't the first rock, not by a long way. And no one was trying to kill him. It just happens. Light was beginning to dawn. I could understand the attraction of having a ready supply of the world's best-known movie stars standing by. If they were in the habit of dying off, that made even more sense. But where did Kleiner get them from? I glanced back at the coffin-shaped tank, and he clapped his hands approvingly. I think the dame's got it, he said. Clever Goyle. Lady, dame, girl, make your mind up. All right, so my mind was on working out the plot rather than witty dialogue right now. You have a way of making someone look how you want. Am I right? Top of the class, doll. You asked about my height and weight, so I'm guessing it's to do with moving bits round rather than hacking them about. I had a vague idea how it might work, but he'd need the sort of power supply that wasn't readily available in 1930s New York. That's right. Kleiner took his cigar out of his mouth for long enough to examine it and seemed surprised it wasn't lit. It's all to do with redistribution of flesh and bone matter. He knocked on the nearest bell jar, and it made a dull, ringing sound. These are all different people, but now, thanks to my work, they look the same. But they're asleep, I pointed out. They're even more bored with what you've done than I am. He chomped his cigar. Funny Goyle. They're just waiting till I need them. As you know, I got a costume store and a prop store and a scenery store. Now I got a star store, too. I peered through the glass at a sleeping, giddy Semestra. She looked just like the real thing, though I realized I'd probably never met the real thing. I wondered who she used to be. What happens to them? I was asking myself as much as Kleiner. My breath misted the glass as I spoke, blurring the woman's sleeping features. They die. He said it easily, like it was no big deal like it wasn't the most important event in his star's short life. The process doesn't last. A couple of weeks, then they pay the price for being beautiful. I guess you burn too bright, you don't burn for long. They get old, I realized. I remembered the old tramp outside Nick's when I was on my way to the launch party. That had been the Rock Railton I met the day before. The one I had promised to help. Too late for him now. They just sort of crumble away, Kleiner said. Sad, but hey, that's life, or rather... He paused to guffaw unpleasantly. It was the sort of sound a donkey might make if it was in intense pain and beyond embarrassment. Or rather, that's death. I didn't share his amusement. So, they die... And you just wheel out a new version, an identical copy. You got it. Have to animate them first. Wake them up. Then the clock starts ticking. Two weeks they got if they're lucky. That's why I keep a few spares. I find a suitable candidate and I process them ready for when I need them. 
A word to the press that they've set their sights on Hollywood and no one's the wiser. But what, I asked as sweetly as I could stomach, if they don't want to cooperate? It might be news to you, but not everyone in this world wants to be a famous movie star. That's no problem. They forget. They forget everything when they wake up. They think they really are Rock Railton or Giddy Semestra. Or Hank? Kleiner's eyes narrowed and his cigar drooped slightly. Or oh, Hank, he agreed. You have a template, I guessed. They only have the memories the real person had at the point that was made. That is why a new Rock Railton doesn't know what the last one got up to or who he met. Same with Giddy Semestra. Same with Hank. His eyes had narrowed so far now that they were in danger of disappearing altogether. He knew it was coming, so before he could work out what to do about it, I turned to face the two Hanks with guns. So, how long have these guys got? I asked. Before they just sort of crumble away. Neither Hank showed any sign of understanding the point I was trying to make. Kleiner had obviously chosen their template for physical rather than mental acuity. I glanced back at the third Hank, who was making some adjustments to the coffin tank. I doubted he knew what acuity meant either. Beyond him, a fourth Hank had appeared in the doorway. He was escorting the severe-looking middle-aged makeup woman I'd seen in the studio. From her expression, I reckoned I'd rather let Lizzie Borden work on my looks than this hatchet-faced harridan. Between them, the new Hank and Hatchet Face were supporting another woman. It took me a moment to recognize Giddy Semestra. As they approached, I heard Kleiner gasp beside me. It wasn't hard to tell why. Giddy's face was drawn and her hair was turning grey. Her forehead was lined and crow's feet framed her eyes. She looked like she had aged twenty years since I last saw her about an hour earlier. Already? Kleiner said. It's getting quicker, Harridan woman said. We need another one, quick. They're still shooting. Giddy looked up at me, confused and afraid. Maybe she recognized me as the one person here who might have some sympathy. Well, she was right there. What's happening to me? she asked in a throaty rasp. Her face looked even more wrinkled than it had just moments before. Nothing to worry about, doll, Kleiner said. The show must go on. And with that, he stepped forward, drew a pistol from inside his jacket pocket, and shot her clean through the head. I say clean. In fact, it was anything but. It would take makeup lady a few minutes to sort out herself and fourth Hank. The bloodstains also spattered the curtain that partitioned off a small area off to the side of the equipment attached to the coffin tank. I'd noted the cables and wires snaking underneath the curtain earlier. Well, hey, I'm a detective. I notice things. And the thing I noticed now was that the curtain shimmered, as if in a breeze. From behind it came a noise that was part way between a sigh and a sharp intake of breath. If Kleiner noticed, he didn't show it. Less than two days this time. He sounded worried, and it wasn't the sort of concern one might naturally expect to feel after shooting dead one of the world's most famous women. He knelt beside Giddy's body, which was lying face down. He turned her over. There was a neat hole drilled through her wrinkled forehead, and she looked, well, let's face it, dead. As we watched, the wrinkles deepened, the flesh sagged, the skin became translucent. Impossibly, she was still aging. I tried to calculate how fast I could get to Kleiner without being shot by a hank. It didn't take me long to decide it was impossible. And in that same short time, the late Giddy Semestra, or whoever she had really been, crumbled to dust. A few moments later, and all that was left was a faint outline on the floor. Even the blood had flaked away, disintegrating to leave only a vague stain. No one else seemed the least bit surprised or shocked by all this. I gave up on surprise a long time ago, and I'm not easily shocked, 
but Kleiner's casual viciousness appalled me. With two of the Hanks still covering me with their guns and another two busy nearby, there was nothing I could do. Not yet. Besides, I have to confess, I was curious to see what happened next. Everything about me is pretty and a lot of it is shrewd, so I had a pretty shrewd idea what was going on. The two spare Hanks, by which I mean the ones who were not busily watching me and waiting for an excuse to shoot, moved to the nearest bell jar. Inside a sleeping giddy semestra leaned against the glass. She was wearing a plain white dress, her features every bit as young and beautiful as in the film posters, or as I had seen her at the party and then again on set. One of the Hanks produced a large axe. The other Hank... Kleiner and Mrs. Makeup stood well clear as Axe Hank swung at the bell jar. The glass exploded, showering down on Hank. He seemed as oblivious to it as he probably was to the meaning of the word. Giddy slopped out, one slender arm thrown forward, a shapely leg visible where her dress had got hitched up. No one seemed worried that she might get cut on the glass. Someone was going to have some sweeping up to do. Big time. Hank and Hank lifted Giddy with surprising delicacy. They carried her over to Kleiner, standing her on her feet. She swayed like a sleepwalker, and Kleiner supported her, head lolling on his shoulder, his arm around her. With a helping hand from the makeup Harridan, he walked Giddy across to the curtain. The makeup woman pulled the curtain open just far enough for me not to be able to see behind it, but sufficient for Kleiner and Giddy to pass through. A few moments later, they were back. Giddy was still relying on Kleiner for support, but now she was awake. She looked disoriented and confused. She looked a little, well, giddy. She saw me. She saw the Hanks. She seemed to recognize none of us. Only Kleiner and the makeup woman, the only people the real Giddy Semestra had known when she was templated. Giddy! I called out. I got a pistol jabbed in my midriff for my pains. It didn't shut me up. They're using you, Giddy! Don't believe a thing they tell you! Don't even believe who you are! Try to remember who you used to be, who you really were! The gun jabbed harder, and I shut up. Not because of the gun, but because from her expression, Giddy obviously thought I was mad. I'm sorry, she said, shaking her head sadly. I'm due on set, and I have lines to learn. It will take me a while. Way things are going, I said to her back as she left. It could take you a lifetime. I turned to Kleiner, who was watching his latest protégé leave. He looked about ready to bite the end off his cigar he was so pleased with himself. You said it yourself. It's accelerating, I reminded him. How long does she have, do you suppose? A whole day, if she's lucky? A couple of hours, maybe? Kleiner's smile might have been pasted on his face for all the change there was in his expression. He walked slowly up to me. I'd better make sure I have a replacement lined up then. He nodded at the line of giddy bell jars. As many replacements as I can find. You're insane, I told him. I don't think he was even listening. His face was looking as pleased as punch. Which was what I was going to do to it just as soon as I got the chance. Cigar and all. Kleiner leaned towards me, even though the top of his head was roughly level with my shoulder. Bet you're wondering how all this is possible, he smarmed. It was a shame to puncture the moment. Actually, that's a bit of a lie. I enjoyed looking him in the top of the head and sighing patiently as if I was explaining things simply to a rather dim-witted child. Not at all, I said. You obviously have an angel.